Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And today we're just gonna cut to the chase. So, the Ebony Warrior and this character's bizarre origins represent one of the biggest and most discussed mysteries in Skyrim. Possibly even the entire Elder Scrolls universe as a whole. For those of you who don't know, or just haven't played in a long time, the Ebony Warrior is a bizarre, full suit of ebony wearing character who will appear and randomly track down the player sometime after you've reached level 80. Now, 80 is a very significant level. It's really high. As a matter of fact, it used to be the highest possible level you could achieve until Bethesda removed the cap with the Dawnguard DLC. Most people will never even bother to get this high in a single playthrough without employing mods or console commands. Usually, you'll be done with the game and most of the major quest lines well before level 60. So, people who grind out these extra levels to get to such an experienced position are really, really dedicated. And have probably already beat the overwhelming majority of the game. Which only makes this moment all the more significant. Anyway, sometime after achieving that 80 milestone, the Ebony Warrior will track us down and deliver the Dragonborn a challenge to a duel. Now, he doesn't have any particular score he's trying to settle or grudge to resolve. Instead, the Ebony Warrior is quite flattering in his tone, stating that he believes we're potentially the last person left in the world capable of safely sending him to Sovngarde and giving him a reasonable death. The time has come. I have done all that can be done. There is nothing left. No quests to be undertaken, no villains to be slain, no challenges to face. Except for you. You are my last challenge. Only you can send me to Sovngarde with honor. Make your preparations. When you're ready, come find me at my last vigil. Now, before we take this story any further, the first thing I want to point out that a lot of people miss about the Ebony Warrior is his size. You see, if you look closely, or frankly, you don't really have to look that closely, you'll notice that the Ebony Warrior is big. Really, really big. He's bigger than any other humanoid or elf NPC in the game. Larger than Mirak, Ulfric, even a Draugr. A look into Skyrim's game files reveals that this is because Bethesda specifically made the Ebony Warrior his own script that allows him to be roughly 25% larger than the normal maximum limit baked into the game's NPC creator. Well, there is one other NPC in the game who uses the same size script as Mr. Ebony Pants, and that character is Soon the Nord God of Trials and Tribulations, whom we encounter outside of Sovngarde at the end of the game's main questline. Soon is the only other character in the base game, more on what I mean by that later, who is the same size as the Ebony Warrior. So, perhaps these special dimensions are communicating something about divinity. Maybe they signal that much like Soon, the Ebony Warrior is more than just another mere mortal. And as we'll see in a bit, that seems to be the case. Nonetheless, after being issued our little duel challenge, we'll receive a marker in our quest log, directing us to a location known as The Last Vigil, an abandoned campsite on the southwestern edge of the Velothi Mountains. Upon our arrival, there will be no formalities. There is no walking up to the Ebony Warrior and initiating dialogue and discussing further. No. Instead, upon our arrival, the Ebony Warrior will just attack the Dragonborn on sight like a maniac. And so we'll begin one of the most challenging and certainly surprising boss battles in the Elder Scrolls universe. Turns out this weird guy who just approaches you at the end of the game has significantly better stats and abilities 
then pretty much all of the major bosses who appear at the end of genuine quest lines, including the main one in Dragonborn DLC. Spawning in at a base level 80 or otherwise matching the player, the Ebony Warrior comes in with a minimum 2,700 points of health. This is already crazy. It's more than Mirak. But when you consider the fact that he's also wearing a full set of ebony armor that offers its own few hundred points of protection, it's an even more challenging ordeal. Speaking of his equipment, he uses an enchanted ebony sword, which is problem enough already, but he also has nearly a dozen additional perks, many of which compound and increase that sword's damage to a ridiculous number. I mean, seriously, take a look at this guy's perk list. This is bigger than just about any other boss. Heck, it might be as big as the players. And finally, as if he already wasn't enough of a major headache, the Ebony Warrior also has the fascinating ability to Dragon Shout. Being able to use the Unrelenting Force and Dragon Disarm Shouts at will, without even needing to respect the time limits. He can shout quicker than us. Alas, if you're looking for tips on how to defeat this opponent, you've come to the wrong video. All I can really recommend is that you just bring your best set of gear and a lot of health potions, and hope you can resist his damage longer than he can yours. Traditionally, a popular community tactic that usually works against enemies with super high damage resistance is to just paralysis spell spam them. But funnily enough, Bethesda thought ahead, and gave the Ebony Warrior a specific perk that allows him to resist all paralysis attacks. So you gotta fight him for real. No matter, when your foe finally does fall, he'll simply say the words, at last, Sovngarde, as he welcomes his fate and his corpse drops to the floor for us to loot. And while this is pretty much the end of the quote-unquote official Ebony Warrior quest, the mystery gets even deeper from here. As when you go ahead and take that glorious set of enchanted ebony armor off of the warrior's body, you'll find that he's actually a red guard. This is very bizarre, given his clear obsession with Sovngarde, a Valhalla-like afterlife realm originally thought to have been exclusively available to Nords and no other races. Red guards are, for their part, thought to have a similar afterlife dimension called the Far Shores. Why didn't this character just want to go there instead? Was he truly trying to gain access into the Nord Paradise? Does he have some sort of fascination with the culture or divine mission he's on? It's unclear. Furthermore, this revelation means that the Ebony Warrior is the only non-Nord in the game, with the possible exception of the player, who's capable of dragon shouting. Such a bizarre fact has given rise to some speculation that perhaps the Ebony Warrior himself is a dragonborn. Or maybe the Redguard God equivalent to that of what the Nords call a dragonborn. And it would certainly fit in line with the other information we have on him. Clearly, there's something more than mortal about this man. But, to be fair, the lore has also firmly established that it's possible for non-divine people and ordinary Nords to learn how to dragon shout themselves through immense study and practice, without any favoritism of the gods. Either way, it's obviously a big deal that the Ebony Warrior has this ability. He either received some sort of incredibly special education, or has some magical characteristics behind them. If somehow you're not already thoroughly spooked about this man, a look in his inventory reveals that the warrior also carries both a human and a daedric heart. 
as well as several flawless soul gems worth tens of thousands of septums in value, making this whole little easter egg boss battle quite worth our time. Unfortunately though, it's at this point Bethesda really just leaves us on a cliffhanger to speculate for ourselves. They provide no further insight on the nature of the warrior, there are no books or letters that explain what's going on, no continuation of the quest, it all just kind of ends once you've slain him. So, what's up here? Well, the community has been trying to answer this question for well over a decade now, and it sparked one of the most fascinating debates in the entire game genre's lore, in my opinion. It seems that the most popular theory is that the Ebony Warrior is himself an aspect of a certain god within the Red Guard pantheon. And we'll discuss that theory momentarily. I do think it has a lot of merit. But first, I want to take you guys back to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. You see, in this game, if you happen to ask an innkeeper in the Suran Trade House if she's heard any rumors lately, she'll tell you about a mysterious orc that's been running around the region in a full set of armor, and specifically goes out of our way to tell us to avoid this character. Of course, being the Nerevarine, after we hear this rumor, our quest log will be updated to track down this bizarre man who will be located in the Molag Amor region of Morrowind. His name is Umbra, apparently. And when you talk with him, you'll find that his personality and motivations are very similar to those of the Ebony Warrior whom we've just battled against. Upon approaching the Orc, he'll give the player the following speech. Now, like many of the NPCs in Morrowind, this orc doesn't actually have a voice actor, so I'll just read all of his lines for you. Quote, Have you come seeking me? My name is unimportant, and my accomplishments are few. What is the use of knowing my name? If it will make you more comfortable, you may call me Umbra, for it is the name of my blade, though it may as well be my own. I have seen the wholesale slaughter of men, women, entire races of people. Villages have burned before my eyes, my hand has held the torch, and my hand has thrown water on the flames. I have been ankle deep in blood, swinging Umbra in a wide arc, all for the glory of battle, and here I still stand. I have no more to do in this life. I have saved whole towns from packs of Daedra and I have slaughtered men for the glory of countless nobles. All that is left for me is my own death, and the gods have cheated me of that. All I ask is to die like a warrior, but how can that be? I don't believe it is too much to ask to die as a warrior should, in battle. It is my curse, though, that I have found no one who can best me in combat. Are you the one that can? Can you come and lift me from these shackles of life? Come then, be the new wielder of Umbra. End quote. So, as you can see, this character is very similar to the Ebony Warrior in his motivations for facing the player. He doesn't hate us or have a grudge or anything. He simply wants to die a noble death and can't find anyone else to give it to him. Furthermore, and in my opinion, significantly more importantly, also like the Ebony Warrior, this Orc Man does not give us his actual name. Instead, he tells us to call him by his sword's name, Umbra, as he sort of become one with it in his identity. Well, if we choose to accept the challenge and face the orc in battle, which, by the way, this orc is not nearly as strong as our ebony warrior, he's much more similar to a normal end of dungeon boss, so you shouldn't have too much trouble in disposing him. Once you defeat the orc, you can take Umbra from his body. It's an enchanted ebony longsword that allows the player to steal the soul 
of any opponent it's used to defeat. Now, after defeating the orc and taking the blade, there's nothing really left for us to do with this whole episode in the game. The quest doesn't go on, it's just kind of a miscellaneous thing that ends abruptly. However, in Morrowind, there exists a book called Tamrielic Lore, written by a character named Yagram Bagarn. Now, Yagram Bagarn is an actual NPC we can meet in Morrowind. He's believed to be the last living dwarf left in all of Tamriel after the race's mysterious disappearance long ago. Anyway, apparently sometime during this man's lonely existence, he wrote this book, Tamrielic Lore, that provides a brief history of various divine and daedric artifacts that can be found throughout the game. And one of those artifacts he mentions is the sword, Umbra. Here's its entry. Quote, the Umbra sword was enchanted by the ancient witch Nainra Ware at the direction of Clavicus Vile, Daedric Prince of Bargains, and its sole purpose was to collect souls for the Daedra. Used in conjunction with a soul gem, the sword allows the wielder the opportunity to imprison an enemy's soul in the gem. Nainra was executed for her evil creation, but not before she was able to hide the sword. The Umbra sword is very choosy when it comes to owners, and therefore remains hidden until a worthy one is found." End quote. Alright, so that's about all Morwind really has to say on the matter. There's not much more lore we can find on this item in the game. However, thankfully, Umbra makes a reappearance in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, and a lot more about the weapon's backstory is explained. In this game, once the player reaches level 20, you'll be able to travel to the Shrine of Clavicus Vile, where you'll meet several worshippers of the Daedric Prince. It's clear something's up with them, but if you talk to the lead priest, a Khajiit, he'll tell you that for a small offering of just 500 coins, you'll be able to speak to the god personally. I played Lord Vile's game and lost my soul. Small loss, I think. He's a hard master, but he delivers. I gave my word, and an orc honors his word. You approach the shrine of Clavicus Vile. You should not be here unless you have business with Lord Clavicus. Here we worship Lord Clavicus. Do you have business with the Daedra? There are many deals to be made, even with a god. You could find great wealth, or painful death. If you wish to bargain with Clavicus Vile, approach with an offering of 500 gold, and hope the Lord smiles on your offering. We watch and wait. A mortal! Wonderful. Always a pleasure. Perhaps a few service for me, mortal, and I'll reward you. A fair bargain, don't you think? You will retrieve for me a sword. A very special sword. It contains the soul of Umbra, a hero I have had dealings with in the past. Bring the sword to me, and I'll reward you with my mask. You'll not find a better bargain, mortal. Begin your search in Hell's Gate. So, apparently Clavicus Vile wants his Umbra sword back. And here, he's requesting that we the player begin searching for it at Pell's Gate, a small village located just south of Cyrodiil. When we arrive here, the locals, in exchange for some bribe money, will reveal that, long ago, the sword was taken by a Bosma resident of the village named Lenwin. Evidently, after stealing the Umbra sword, Lenwin slowly began to go mad and lose her sense of identity. She became aggressive and bizarre, and eventually flood the entire community outright. 
The community's humorously named patriarch, Hiroki the Wide, claims that Lenwin, now calling herself Umbra, has fled to the Vindasasel ruins, where she hopes her anger can be contained and she'll be able to live with the sword without hurting anyone else. Welcome to Pell's Gate. What brings you around here? I, I know of Umbra, but you're a stranger to me, and I'm not talking. What? Every little bit helps. Umbra, that's a name I haven't heard in a while. And it's not one you should be using around Pell's Gate, either. Uh, before I go on, let's clear something up. Are you here asking about the sword? Or the person? Which is it? It's a powerful sword, no doubt about that. Jet black. Got a wicked edge on it. And they say it can steal a man's soul. I know of at least one soul it stole. Lenwin. She's the one who found the blasted thing. I suppose you want to hear about the person now. Who is Umbra? I can tell you who Umbra used to be. Lenwin. She's my apprentice, or at least she was, until she found that sword. Never did say where it came from. She just showed up with it one day, said it was called Umbra. But she was different. She'd always been fair with a sword. But she began looking for fights, became bloodthirsty and then started calling herself Umbra after the sword. Finally signed on with some mercenaries, but I hear that ended too. We haven't seen her in years. Can't say for sure. Some say they've seen her nearby, near the Vindasal ruins. Might just be wishful thinking, though. If she's around, she hasn't come into Pell's Gate, nor should she. I fear that girl is long gone. If you seek her out, take care. She's a powerful one, or at least that sword is. I'd steer clear if I was you. The Vindicel ruins aren't very much different from any other alien ruin. Inside, there's some skeevers, some booby traps, a couple generic enemies, and at the end, we'll finally encounter the woman, now calling herself... Umbra. Interestingly, she dons a full set of ebony armor, unlike the orc we met earlier. Upon approaching her, she won't be immediately hostile. Instead, much like her predecessor, she'll begin a long speech, explaining her life story and coming off as rather tragic and reluctant, before finally offering us one last chance to avoid bloodshed and just leave unharmed. Unfortunately, though, we know that's not an option. Get out of here while you can. You risk much by speaking to me. You should leave this place. Now. Umbra is my blade. It is who I am. Who I was meant to be. For years I have fed my blade the souls of man and myrrh. Warriors and priests, kings and paupers, men, women and children, all have bled for me. I have seen them all fall, and still Umbra hungers for more. Do not speak to me of that place. It was another lifetime. It was before I became what I am now. Perhaps they sent you to kill me. Are they worried I might come in the night and burn their village down around them? No matter. I am what I've become, and I know my fate. But what of you? What is it you seek? My death? My blade? I offer you a choice. More than I have offered most. Stay here and die. Or leave now and live your life. Speak to me again when your mind is set. Man, what a dramatic speech. 
and it's clearly a testament to the dramatic amount of influence this blade has over its hosts. It's essentially possessed this woman. She stripped herself of her original identity, even her name, as did the orc before her. So, what happens next? Well, Lenwin is actually a very difficult NPC to defeat. Her full suit of ebony armor makes her very damage resistant, and she has some pretty powerful base stats on her own. Either way though, once you've defeated her, you'll have the ability to take the sword back to the Shrine of Clavicus Vile in exchange for a reward. Alternatively, you can also choose not to give the sword back, and just keep it for yourself. The quest will still complete all the same. Now, here's where things get kind of interesting. You see, the Umbra sword does not appear in the base game version of Skyrim at all. It's just not present. Clavicus Vile, the Daedric Prince of Bargains, does make an appearance and has his own mini quest line. However, that revolves around retrieving an entirely different and unrelated artifact for the god, and no additional Umbra lore is given. At least, not in the base game. However, in March of 2019, Skyrim's Creation Club, everybody's favorite service, received a pretty big update. And in this update, a new creation was added to the marketplace, called Umbra for 500 credits. Now, hold your rage, bear with me for a second. This Umbra creation was kind of interesting, because rather than just add the sword into the player's inventory, like most creations do, this one instead adds a new dungeon into the game that the player must crawl through in order to acquire the object. And this new dungeon is called Champion's Rest. Take a look at its location on the map for a second. Notice how remarkably close to the last vigil it is, where we actually face off against the Ebony Warrior after accepting his duel challenge. Seriously, Champion's Rest is like on the same trail we have to follow to get to the last vigil. Clearly, someone made this placement on purpose. At least you would think, right? Well, let's continue. Upon entering the cavern, we'll find ourselves in its first chamber, where a small campsite seems to have been set up. And on a table will be a journal titled Vigilance Report that gives us some insight on this location. It's a pretty short read, so I'll just read the whole thing. Quote, I, Cassipia Sagnus, vigilant of Stendar, do hereby issue this report on my investigation into the reports of a dark presence within Champion's Rest. Champion's Rest is the site of an ancient battle arena, where Nords would test their mettle in gladiatorial combat. Long believed to be lost to time, it was recently uncovered by mining prospectors near Shore's Stone after discovering a new deposit of silver. Upon discovery, the miners say they witnessed a, quote, ghost clad head to toe in armor. While this alone was cause for concern, what they said next was even more foreboding. The spirit wielded a massive blade, which seemed to whisper to them in their minds. This hints at the workings of a powerful Daedric artifact. The only relic that matches this description is Umbra. Once believed to be lost, or by some accounts, destroyed, Umbra is a sentient weapon who corrupts its bearer and compels them to kill so that the blade may feast on the souls of those it slays. It appears to have resurfaced here, though why I cannot say. If the apparition that haunts this site is truly the resurgence of Umbra, then it has grown very powerful and Shore Stone is in grave danger." End quote. Okay, so apparently this place, Champion's Rest, was once the site of some sort of gladiatorial arena that we'll probably see later on in the dungeon. And after being re-excavated by miners, there are reports that a new wielder of Umbra is somewhere in this dungeon. Let's continue. For the most part, this dungeon is just like any other. Takes a good 10 to 15 minutes to clear and is loaded with skeletons, Draugr, a couple puzzles, you know everything we've come to expect out of Skyrim Caverns. Though, something you will notice while progressing through this location 
is that every now and then, out of the corner of your eye, a ghost clad in ebony armor will briefly appear and disappear before you can get a good look at him. How spooky. Finally, at the end of the cave, we'll enter a giant amphitheater, with that ebony ghost we've seen earlier sitting down at the center in a bit of a praying animation. This is the current wielder of Umbra. And as we approach, he'll turn hostile, and yet another epic boss battle will ensue. As you've probably come to expect by now, Umbra is no easy foe to face in Skyrim. And in fact, I'd argue that he may even be a little bit harder than the Ebony Warrior himself. Because not only does Umbra wear a very similar full set of Ebony armor with a very high level, but he also remains in ghost form for most of your battle, and is therefore completely immune to damage. The player can only hurt this foe when he leaves his ghost form every few minutes for a brief couple of seconds, and when he does leave his ghost form to become flesh again, several bound ghosts will spawn around him and only further harass the player, making this a very, very difficult fight to come out on top of. Now, remember when earlier in the video I made a really big deal about the Ebony Warrior's uniquely large size, and how he and Asun are the only characters in the base game that have this 25% size buff? Well, this Umbra enemy we're facing also has that same size script, and this character, who, mind you, is fully clad in dark black ebony armor, is also the exact same size as the Ebony Warrior. He has the buff too. I find this shared detail to be almost too big of a coincidence. Remember, Champion's Rest just so happens to be located right next to the spot where we defeat the vanilla Ebony Warrior. So the signs seem to be pointing to some sort of connection between these two themes though the exact nature of that connection is still somewhat unclear. After defeating this version of Umbra, his corpse will drop and you'll be free to loot it. In there will be some more of the expected items, of course his full set of ebony armor, and specifically, the legendary sword, Umbra, which, just like in Morrowind and Oblivion, has a unique enchantment which allows it to steal the souls of enemies it's used to defeat. Notably, if you remove Umbra's helmet, you'll find that he's not a red guard like the Ebony Warrior, but instead an Imperial with pitch black eyes, an allusion to the possessing effects of the blade. On our way out, it's also possible to stumble across a notebook titled Treasure Hunter's Journal, and it seems to have been written by the Imperial man who we just faced as Umbra. His original name was Crestius and he came to Skyrim from Cyrodiil in search of abandoned caverns and new mining opportunities. Unfortunately, he seems to have clearly bit off more than he was equipped to handle here, and one day after falling through a cave and landing in Champion's Rest, he heard the Umbra Sword whispering to him. And, well, the rest is history. Alright, so obviously there are some links between what's going on here in Champion's Rest and the Ebony Warrior we all know and love. The locations are right next to each other, and the primary characters are very similar in their equipment and identical in their unique statures. However, aside from those large and obvious details, we don't really have any other information that furthers the link. There's no book or dialogue we come across in the dungeon that explains the connection, Instead, there are just these inferences scattered about and we're supposed to put together. It's worth noting that the place we fight the Ebony Warrior at, his quote-unquote last vigil, does seem to be an abandoned mining camp, what with mining pickaxes and boots laying all over the place. So perhaps the Ebony Warrior was involved in some mining operations linked to this cave. However, that connection may be incidental at best. Furthermore, I should also point out that the Ebony Warrior has a special enchanted ebony sword. It doesn't have the exact same enchantment as the Umbra sword, which allows you to steal souls, but instead it possesses the Vampire enchantment, which allows the player to drain HP from targets and absorb that HP as their own. 
So maybe if we squint our eyes a bit, we could see this sword the Ebony Warrior uses as kind of related to Umbra. But even then, it's not the kind of solid smoking gun connection we're looking for. Because we still can't confirm this Umbra theory, despite what I consider to be a preponderance of evidence, I'd like to take this time right now and switch our focus over to an entirely different theory that's certainly been around for much longer than this one. You see, it wasn't really until this new creation released that people began to seriously consider the association between the Ebony Warrior and the Umbra Sword. Before that, though, there had been an entirely different leading theory in the community. One that argued the Ebony Warrior was not a mortal at all, but instead, a famed Redguard god. You see, while Nords and Imperials largely share the same divine pantheon and pray to the exact same gods with slightly different names, Red Guards are a little bit more unique, in a bit that they have devised their own entire set of beliefs with several unique characters. One unique god in the Red Guard religion is known as Hunding. Now, the best way I can explain Hunding to someone who's not very well-versed in the Redguard Pantheon is that he's kind of like the Hammerfell version of the Dovahkin. Just like how the Dovahkin is a mortal person born with the soul of a dragon who appears at critical times in human history, think Saint Alicia when saving the humans from the Elven Slayers, or Ysgrimor when he founded the Empire, or of course, the player when he's saving the world from Alduin, Hunding is kind of like that, in of it that he manifests in a material form whenever the Redguard people are in need of a hero to help them. There have been several instances of these Hunding characters manifesting and saving the day. One example would be in the character Frandar Hunding. Frandar Hunding was a Yokudan prince born in the year 720 of the First Era. Frandar and most Redguards during this time period did not live in Tamriel. Instead, they lived on an island chain west of Tamriel called Yokuda, hence the adjective Yokudin. Well, Frandar's legacy is that he led the Redguard people away from these islands when they began to sink in the sea, and established his race on the coasts of Hammerfell, hence bringing the Redguards over here. During the events of the Elder Scrolls Online, we have the opportunity to meet Lord Frandar Hunding's ghost, and learn a bit more about him. During our encounter, we learn that Hunding was a deep devotee of a practice known as sword singing. Now, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of information about what exactly sword singing is, but what it seems to be is basically the Red Guard version of dragon shouting, through some sort of divine relationship they have with their weapons. It seems as though certain Red Guards who possess the right gift, or simply study enough, are able to use their blades in such a way that they produce powerful sounds. Sound familiar? And evidently Frandar was a big devotee of this. So much so that he ended up developing an entire new philosophy around appropriately using this power for good. A philosophy which he called the Way of the Sword. Now, if that philosophy name, The Way of the Sword, sounds kind of familiar to you, it definitely should. Because in The Elder Scrolls V, we learn that the Greybeards practice a philosophy they call The Way of the Voice, created by their founder, a man named Jurgen Windcaller. There are also several strong similarities in both the stories of Jurgen and Frandar, in of it that they both won great battles, proceeded to live in isolation for several years before developing benevolent philosophies, so on and so forth. Not only that, but they also lived during the same time period, in around the 700s of the First Era, which is a little sus if you ask me. Another, perhaps even more relevant character that's said to be a manifestation of Hunding is a legendary figure known as Raymon Ebenarm, also called the Black Knight. Now, this dude has never directly appeared in any of the Elder Scrolls games. Instead, he's really just a name that occasionally gets sprinkled in books here and there, but we've been hearing about him ever since Daggerfall in 98. All of our sources describe Ebenarm similarly, 
He's very tall, heavily muscled, and, specifically, always wears a full suit of ebony armor. Oddly enough, this absolute warrior seems to be described more as an agent of peace than anything else. The book The Ebon Arm, which appeared in Daggerfall, written by a certain Witten Roll, describes one event where the Black Knight rode in the middle of a battlefield to stop two armies from colliding, and was praised glamorously by both sides. He's also described as having his right arm literally fused with his ebony blade. Quote, as he raises his right arm, all see an arm and a magnificent ebony blade, which are extensions of each other. The fused arm and sword are a result and symbol of the wounds suffered by this god during titanic battles in the youth of this world. End quote. Some players have argued this statement about him could just be a metaphor. You know, being connected to his blade, implying he's just really attuned with the weapon and familiar with it. However, the claim appears in multiple books, so Bethesda seems to mean it literally. Nonetheless, due to their similar choices for attire and apparent divine status, many players have begun to speculate that perhaps the Ebony Warrior is really just another manifestation of this Raymond Ebon Arm godlike figure, who himself, you'll remember, is a manifestation of this broader Yokudin deity known as Hoonding. Obviously, this theory is more of a complex one, though in the Elder Scrolls universe, it's those that are often accurate as well. The connection with this Red Guard deity and the sword singing practice offer the only reasonable explanation behind the warrior's ability to dragon shout. Additionally, it's hard to ignore the fact that they both stem from the same Red Guard culture. Everything seems to fit together here. However, there are also still some things this doesn't explain. Like, for instance, why has the Ebony Warrior appeared now? What critical danger do the Red Guard people face? Furthermore, what grudge would this being seek to settle with the Dragonborn? If anything, the Ebon Arm figure and Hunding are described as agents for peace, who resent the idea of bloodshed in general. So this really wouldn't fit in line with their personalities. Also, what would a Red Guard deity want to get into Sovngarde for? Then again, why would a Red Guard talk about going to Sovngarde at all? Interestingly, in the Elder Scrolls Online's game files, we can find various references to Raymon Ebonarm, including several pieces of concept art to make him a character. However, he never actually appears in the game itself, so anything they were planning to have done must have been cut. Furthermore, several of the books throughout Elder Scrolls history that mention Raymond Ebonarm reappear in ESO. However, they have all references directly to the character removed. Like, they delete entire paragraphs where his name is incidentally brought up. Almost like they're trying to retcon this figure out of existence. So, it's really difficult to decide whether or not this Raymond Hoonding theory has any weight, considering that Bethesda doesn't even seem to be sure with the fate of the character. It's entirely possible that the developers really did have some sort of narrative plan for this Ebon Arm Ebony Warrior Link, but just ended up determining it wasn't practical and abandoning it. At the same time, though, there still exist many differences between the characters. Raymond is said to have blondish red hair and blue eyes, whereas the Ebony Warrior has brown hair and brown eyes. I mean, sure, there could be some hair dye and colored contacts involved, but I doubt that's the case here. Alrighty. So far at this point in the video, we've covered two very different ideas regarding what the Ebony Warrior's origins could be. One arguing that he's somehow related to the ancient Daedric artifact Umbra, and the other suggesting that he's a manifestation of the ancient Red Guard god Hunding who's been known to sometimes appear as a warrior dressed in ebony armor. But alas, there's one last piece of, shall we say, evidence that I would like to show you regarding the warrior that doesn't really fit in with either of these theories, though seems pretty significant in its own right. In 2019, ESO received its Dragonhold DLC. This expansion added in the region of Southern Elsewhere, and, as you might guess, 
It doesn't really have a lot to do with the topics we're discussing in this video. However, one of the books added in by this DLC that describes Khajiiti lore is called The Dark Spirits. This novel describes various deities and demons who the Khajiits are known to fear. Most of this list is stuff you would expect, Daedra like Nymeera, Nocturnal, etc. However, there's one entry in this book of a nameless spirit. Literally, their name is just a bunch of question marks. And here's its description. Quote, a spirit of vengeance. It has no will of its own, as it was born from Azura's grief after the death of Fatome and Lorkaj. None can summon the spirit, save Azura, Boethia, and Mafala, for only they know its true name. It sometimes appears in songs as a black panther, a warrior in ebony armor, or as a hidden sword. A hidden sword or a warrior in ebony armor. Where have we heard those themes before? Well, I think you know where. Anyway guys, that about does it for us today. I think we've done a pretty good job at giving this ebony warrior video its proper justice, so to speak. There's been a lot of content discussing him before, but none that I've seen that's really explored this Umbra connection. And I'm sure there's quite a bit that I'm missing, which you guys can remind me of in the comments down below. Thanks for stopping by, everybody. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated, and I hope to catch you all in the next video. Peace out, everyone.